Here in the Canadian North, we are just now starting to move into spring. And that means for me, with the air warming to something reasonable, it's time to break out the telescope. So I think this is a great time to begin introducing the other major topic of this channel, astrophotography. And over the coming weeks, I hope to run you through a fairly complete course on the topic. Now there's a lot to learn, so buckle up. And if you're already well experienced at astrophotography, odds are pretty good you're going to know most of this stuff. But if you're just wanting to learn, my intent is to show you how and to show it well from start to finish. Astrophotography gives us access to the stars. You might choose to use a fairly serious setup like this one. A solidly capable equatorial mount, capable of carrying a large and serious telescope or two. Though you don't need that, thanks to advances in modern technology, these days you can get by with even an ordinary DSLR and get some extraordinary shots whether you're using wide-angle lenses or high focal length lenses. The biggest limitation these days is not so much access to technology, it's technique. So I'm going to start by introducing one of my favorite astro imaging techniques, speckle imaging, more commonly known as lucky imaging. And while I think some persons might consider this to be an advanced technique, I think it's one that new astrophotographers would do well to learn from the beginning. Because once you learn to do some somewhat technical things like stacking images, it allows you to produce images that are much less limited by distortions in Earth's atmosphere. Let's take a moment and talk about those distortions. In astrophotography, we have to deal with a number of potential problems, such as chromatic aberration, light pollution, whether that's from urban lights or even the full moon, difficulty finding guide stars for tracking, plain old simple bad weather, and, perhaps most commonly of all, atmospheric distortion. When you look up at the stars at night and see them twinkle, what you are actually seeing is atmospheric distortion. This happens because there are cells of air overhead that are of slightly different temperature, so they push, prod, and pull against one another. And those little cells of air refract light differently. So the movement of light appears to vary slightly to our eyes. In other words, when we look up, things twinkle. And if we look at objects that are enhanced through the optics of a telescope, that twinkling becomes worse, and objects can appear to waver. Anyone who has ever looked at the moon through the eyepiece of a telescope on a night of poor seeing, when the air overhead is moving a lot, will have seen this. It looks a bit like the moon is being seen through water. Now, our brains understand this and pretty well compensate for it. It doesn't bother us, at least not when we are observing something through the eyepiece of a telescope. But cameras are not nearly so smart. A camera will record this distortion, and it results in blurred or smudged areas in an image. Now, nothing can make up for shooting on a night of good seeing when there's little atmospheric distortion, or if you have the option, getting your telescope up to high altitude. That way, there's less atmosphere between you and the stars. But for many of us, we do not live in places where we can get up high. Here in Nova Scotia, where I live, about the highest point you're going to find is perhaps 300 meters. But just as technology has given us ways to deal with light pollution, a topic we'll also cover later, technology has also given us a way to deal with atmospheric distortion. And it is called speckle imaging, or more commonly these days, lucky imaging. The technique gets its name from the fact that when shooting lucky imaging, you'll shoot hundreds, perhaps thousands of images of a target, and you'll only keep the best ones, the ones that you get lucky with, the ones that have little to no distortion. And when you learn how to master this technique, it is extraordinarily powerful. It has its limitations, everything does, but it is a great way to work around atmospheric distortion. I'm going to illustrate this by showing you three images now of the same target. The two images below are the results of lucky imaging. They were both made with the same string of 500 one second long exposures at unity gain for my Player One Uranus C camera, which is 180 gain. Now, if you're new to astrophotography, that's probably a lot of Greek. It means that I took 500 images of the moon, each one one second long. Gain in astrophotography is pretty much the same as ISO in ordinary photography. So you can think of 180 gain as like 180 ISO. And unity, put very simply, is that point where the gain is ideal. It makes the most out of the camera sensor. But in a nutshell, it's the ratio where you get the most desired signal and the least amount of noise. For now, don't worry about it. We'll come to it also in a later video. 
Now the top portrays pretty much the same moon on the same night shot in the same atmospheric conditions by my friend Bev down in southwest Nova Scotia. She was using a DSLR with a different sensor and different lenses. I'm going to use it here as a control. Bev shot her image of the moon at 420 millimeters focal length. My images were shot with an apochromatic doublet refractor at 480 millimeters. Also, Bev was shooting at 220 ISO. So while not exactly the same, close enough for our purposes here. The thing to bear in mind here is the image at the top is the result of a single exposure. The two images at the bottom are both the results of stacking, though the lower left image is effectively a single exposure. Let me explain. For the purposes of this experiment, I have simply stacked 100% of all 500 images that I took. Compositing all the images together makes that lower left shot a lot like a single exposure. The composite will show the strengths of the photograph as well as the results of any atmospheric wavering or jitter. The image on the lower right is made from the same image string as that on the lower left, but I've only used the best 15% of all the images that I shot. The auto stacking software, AutoStacker, discarded the other 85% of the images, anything that showed even the slightest hints of jitter. Let's do some pixel peeping and see what results that got us. We'll start by taking a look at Bev's image. While it's quite good for a casual shot with a DSLR with a zoom lens, and shows a fair bit of detail, medium and especially fine detail are washed out. And to get this single exposure very quickly, Bev had to use a greater gain or ISO, which made for a not as good dynamic range. The camera is having a harder time catching the lights and the darks. This also works against the sensor being able to portray the finer details of the moon. To illustrate, I'll manually improve the exposure now, but we still won't see quite the detail that we are looking for. There, the corrections are subtle, but they are significant. We've been able to darken the shadows, and I even increased the mid-range sharpness just a bit. But as you're about to see, we're still missing that fine detail, because it's just not there. It was lost in shooting quickly in a single exposure with a high ISO. Let's bring up the next image. This is the one that was shot with a dedicated telescope using a dedicated astro camera, and made from a string of 500 one-second photos stacked together. This is also the one where I used 100% of all those images. Because the hardware is more appropriate for astrophotography, we will see an increase in mid-range detail and even the smaller detail. But the image will nonetheless suffer just a bit due to the moderate atmospheric distortion that was going on that night. Because we have used 100% of the 500 images in this string, the imperfections created by that jitter were captured and added to the final image in stacking. Now let's take a look at the final image, the same string of 500 images, but using only 15% of the subframes, thereby discarding anything less than nearly perfect. You can probably immediately see that this image has captured the most detail. This is because we have only kept to the nearly perfect frames. By using lucky imaging, even on this windy night, atmospheric distortion was overcome, and an amazing amount of detail is captured in the final image. Let's take a moment and compare the 15% stacked image to Bev's single frame image. Side by side like this, the difference in detail that was able to be captured is immediately apparent. Now let's compare the 15% stacked image to the 100% stacked image, which again is virtually the equivalent of a single frame image. You can see that the 100% stacked image on the right has a lot more detail than Bev's image and it is much closer to the 15% stacked image. But if we zoom in and take a closer look, we can see that the 15% image has captured the fine detail subtly better. Let's have a look. At this magnification, the differences are subtle, but they are there. For example, take a look at the ridge rising above the plane lower right of each image. You can see that the 15% stacked image on the left has captured sharper resolution, both of the structure of the ridge and also the craters above and behind. And in this highly blown up photo, the, the difference doesn't seem all that significant, but when we go back to the normal size of the image, that difference adds up more and more. Ultimately meaning that the 15% stacked image will suffer less from any atmospheric distortion effects. In the case of lucky imaging, less is more. You take lots and lots of images and then take away everything that is imperfect and only leave the best images. But lucky imaging is not without its challenges. 
The process of stacking tends to introduce noise. However, modern CMOS sensors handle noise better, and we'll take a look at that also in a later video. Also, because Lucky Imaging is going to discard a great deal of the subframes, overall, Lucky Image strings need more time in total to shoot than would be required of longer single frames, even if many longer single frames are intended to be stacked together to make a final composite. You can do Lucky Imaging even with an ordinary DSLR. You can simply have the DSLR shoot lots of individual photos such as JPEGs or TIFFs, or even better, shoot RAW, or you can set the DSLR to shoot video and then stack the individual video frames. Though of course, it is better to use a dedicated astro camera such as the Player One Uranus C. This camera is made specifically for lucky imaging and has very little in the way of noise. It also allows me to shoot strings of AV files or video files and it gives me much more control of the exposure time of video files than I would get with a DSLR. Typically when shooting video types of files with a DSLR, you get very limited control of how long each frame is. 1 24th of a second, 1 30th of a second, 1 60th of a second, and so on. And really, to do good lucky imaging, you're going to need much more control than that. And often, you're going to be shooting with a modern CMOS camera, hundreds or even thousands of exposures between 1 and 15 seconds. But this video is just to introduce the advantages of lucky imaging. A lot of folks out there doing astrophotography are still aiming for the longest exposures possible. But changes in modern technology mean that new options, even better options, are now available to us. And lucky imaging, I think, is one with tremendous promise. It's been used for a while now for brighter objects such as planets and the moon. But modern technological developments mean lucky imaging is a good candidate for deep sky objects as well. If you are interested in lucky imaging, stay tuned because in future episodes, we'll explore step by step how to do lucky imaging and how to process the final results. Thank you for venturing into the cosmos with me in this episode of Sky Story. Sky Story is part of the Understory Network, a collection of programs devoted to the study of the natural world. In MicroStory, we study the invisible world of the very small. In Understory, we examine natural history and issues of conservation. And in Sky Story, we look beyond Earth and explore the cosmos. There will be many more episodes, so to keep abreast, please take a moment to subscribe, and don't forget to hit that like button.